So just wanted to let you all know, um, thank you all, good morning. Thank you all for coming here. And this will be recording, so I'm going to just hit the recording button now. Okay, welcome everybody. It's nice to see you all here. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Dr. James Ikonomopoulos. Uh, you can call me Dr. I. You can call me uh, Jimmy if you want. Um, and I'm an associate professor at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. And um, we're very excited to have you all here. And we have um, our TechShip program, which is a, a specialization in our program that prepares counseling students to work in integrated behavioral health care settings. And we are funded by HRSA, our Health Resource Service Administration, um, to strengthen the behavioral health workforce in Texas. So we've been um, adding... Uh, presentations. We've been having trainings, and this is our yearly symposium, and we have two outstanding presenters today, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves in a second, but first I wanted to have Dr. Uzandu go ahead and introduce herself. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is uh, Dr. Ada Uzandu. I'm the program assistant for TESHIP. Once again, we're glad you're here, and I will soon send in a uh, the evaluation that you will submit at the end if you would like to get a CUU. And we also like you to put your email in the chat so we will be able to send you your certificate at the end. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So we will be offering CU. So um, we're very excited to uh, offer that today. And we will be having our first presentation from 10 to 12. And um, we will then have a break from 12 to 1. And then we'll have our next presentation from one to three. Um, and we have Dr. Russ Curtis and Katie Getz presenting from 10 to 12. And their topic is the mindset and clinical skills needed to thrive in integrated care. And then at one o'clock, we'll have Dr. John Sonsomanigan presenting. And his topic is tough kids, cool counseling, strategies for engaging and getting for you. If y'all could please mute, because we are getting an echo. Thank y'all. So one more time, too. Um, if you're looking to get CEUs, please put your emails in the chat, and then we'll be um, sending you all a certificate, and we'll also have a survey at the end of the year. All right, so at this time, Dr. Uh, Russ Curtis and Katie, would y'all like to go ahead and introduce yourselves and begin? Yes, thank you, um, Katie. I'm just kind of jumping out here, but uh, that's okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. I and uh, Dr. Uzando for hosting us and and uh, having us. Uh, really grateful to talk about uh, integrated behavioral health care. And um, yeah, I did want to. We kind of clarified a few things. Uh, feel free to. We want this to be interactive. Uh, if the chat is more convenient. Um, Dr. I said that he would monitor for us, and um, so be aware of that, that we'll be doing that. And, and when we pull up the presentation, I'll kind of get into a little bit more introductions. But yeah, thank you for being here. Thanks, Russ. Just happy to be here and would love for y'all to engage and use the chat. I know there's a big group, but we would love to hear from you. And um, if you're turning your video off because you've got dogs or small children walking by, we're okay with that. I once saw a pig in the background of a video and that was okay with me. So just love to see your faces. And if you can't, we get that too. And I'll pull that up, Russ. How's that look for you? Great. Looks good for me. Are we okay? Yeah. And just a uh, housekeeping, maybe around the hour point, we may take a quick five minute uh, break, uh, if that's okay. And then also feel free to stand up, lay down, move around, stretch. Um, if this was an actual classroom, we do all that kind of stuff in my class. So feel free that we don't need to be sitting the entire time. We can stand up and so forth. All right. Katie, you wanna go ahead and move it on? I was, uh, first of all, this is what we will uh, be covering and uh, hopefully take a lot of questions. And our goal, our overall goal is to leave you perhaps with um, 
new mindset to be thinking about uh, when you come in and work uh, clinically in all the various types of integrated care types of settings, but also practical down to earth cl uh, clinical skills. Uh, so hopefully some kind of broad minded stuff to maybe think differently about integrated care, but also stuff that you could hopefully tomorrow would be able to utilize uh, with clients that you're using. So this is what we're looking at. Um, I wanted to, yeah, okay, we can move on to the next one. Yeah, Just a little bit about me. I'm a professor of counseling at Western Carolina University. This is my 23rd year in the, it's, we're in the Asheville area. Uh, we have a satellite campus. Um, actually, Cullowee is an hour west of Asheville and is located on sacred Cherokee land. But if you can see my background, just in five minutes from my house, I've also found a lot of artifacts, uh, native artifacts. This is important to us. So we, we spend a lot of time with uh, land acknowledgement uh, and in our program, just recognizing uh, that we are on sacred Cherokee land specifically, but also talking about kind of the um, uh, the philosophy of Native Americans and Cherokee and how we can integrate that into mental health and wellness and so forth. I was really impressed with uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi's uh, learning, uh, student learning objectives with how much the term integration was used in there. We're going to integrate group uh, and and uh, integrate the counseling skills that we learn into the various settings. So that's one thing we're looking at too, is how do we take non-colonized viewpoints and, and integrate uh, and honor uh, what those perspectives are and start to really take a close look at how kind of a colonized perspective has shaped our medical world. I, uh, as you'll see here, I'm cisgender, 57 year old white heterosexual male, first gen college student, first born of two. I've got a sister two years younger. I'm trying to use my privilege to increase awareness of systematic psychopathy and also positive psychotherapy. We'll talk more about that as we move on. Um, INTJ, Pisces, Enneagram 4, and a Hufflepuff. Um, I uh, feel free on my Instagram, Bougie Pawpaw, to follow me. Uh, I like to have a little fun there. I think we need more humor in the world. And also in terms of the spirit of integration, uh, if you go to the WCU Counseling webpage, we have links to uh, our uh, magazines. We've got an Intersection magazine, uh, which is a more of a collaboration with our community partners, and then a Masterpiece magazine, which is a collaboration with our school partners, where we try to celebrate art while providing mental health and wellness information. And so from the broader spirit of integration, we're trying to work closely with our partners and see how that we can um, uh, work together in ways that help lift our society and so forth. Okay. And I'm Katie Getz. Um, I went to Western Carolina where Russ is a professor and um, can't say enough about staying in connection with your university, um, how much that has helped me grow as a counselor and also been a real resource to the work that I've been doing and to um, the agencies where I've worked. Um, I'm a mom. I have two little ones, a four-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, a sister, a partner, and then you'll see my cute little dog there. And uh, my undergrad was in English and theater, which I think uh, really helped out in counseling. Um, also that I needed to have another degree with that. Um, and I was the youngest of four girls and we all played sports, many of us soccer players. And I really believe the skills I had then, which weren't many, I always tried to come in shape and run a lot and be a good team player, really lend their way to integrated care, um, to really like look for the long haul, be patient and be a good team member and really try to use my privilege to um, really support other other people in their whiteness as so much of the work that we do is influenced by the urgency and the funding and the check boxes. And while those may be necessary at times, just trying to hold that at the end of the day, we are here sitting in front of people and we're also people and that this work is hard. Um, and you'll see my team Ted Lasso down there, but not be surprising. Um, just 
really believing and trying to be, um, bring a little kindness to the work, um, to the folks that we serve, but also to the people we're doing it with. And I should say that Katie has uh, a lot of experience with integrated care, boots on the ground work. She's been in agencies close to 20 years, maybe over that, Katie, uh, and is really a leader in integrated care. She's helped develop uh, uh, practices in her area in Western North Carolina. Uh, so that's why when I was asked to do this, I was like, I can do it in one condition, and that's if Katie can join me. So we really are fortunate to have her. She's supervised in um, uh, resilience modeling for trauma care. Uh, she's got special certifications in addictions, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, EMDR. So we really do have a talented person here. I also want to say um, that uh, I got interested, my first job outside of, uh, well, after doing my master's was in a comprehensive clinical or a clinical mental health center. We had three psychiatrists, two nurses, um, pulse rates and blood pressure were taken each time. I'll talk about why this was very effective. So it felt very integrated. We worked closely with what would now be considered a federally qualified health center uh, at the time. And my job as an intensive case manager was to make sure that my SPMI uh, clients, do, uh, clients with severe and persistent mental illness who also had medical conditions got comprehensive whole person care. When I came into academia, shortly after we wrote an article with a student about integrated care and then in 2012 with another graduate created an edited textbook. And so that's kind of my experience now I've been supervising, that's the primary job, well, uh, in addition to research and writing and teaching, is supervising students, uh, some of which are in integrated care. But I will also say that um, we're all doing integrated care at some level. It, even if you're a private practitioner, you're doing integrated care at some level. So we'll talk more about that as we go. So one thing I want us to think about, and if you maybe keep a scrap sheet of paper nearby or a document on the desktop, is our main learning objective that we want to discuss at the end are the mindset skills that you can take with you from today and the clinical skills. So just keep those in mind as we move through the presentation. Okay. I have, oh, and you know, I, I also want to mention that the resources that TextChip has are amazing. Um, and I will be sharing these with class. The uh, presentation on broaching, on LGBTQ care, on um, conduct disorder, the virtual uh, simulations, role plays, and so forth, it truly is a, uh, a gem of a resource, and I'm going to be sharing those. Know that I'm borrowing some stuff from that, but we'll also kind of recommend that you make sure you're watching these videos. They really are a great free resource uh, that I've been watching on YouTube for the past, past month. One thing we want to pay attention to with integrated care is... Um, when working within a medical practice, there's still very much of a medical model mindset in that there is an illness and that it's deficiency minded. I'm talking about the system, not the people. The people are magnificent within healthcare. Uh, as in anything, we may have folks with strengths and challenges, as we all do. The systems can sometimes be broken, uh, oftentimes broken, and maybe even sick. But what we don't want to do as learning about integrated care is to lose our person-centeredness, our uniqueness. And so I would ask that you take some time to think about what makes you unique. And while learning about, we must learn about all the systems that are creating inequality and oppression and discrimination. And that can be a real challenge at the time to not then start to see everything as sick. So we have to really, we have to increase our awareness of all the discrimination and inequalities while also still being able to see the hope and the uniqueness and ask the right questions to make changes. Hey, let me see if there's one other thing. So, so you're allowed to think differently. 
<laughs> I encourage you to do that. And please, please be who you are. I think this is a huge piece of counseling is helping clients get back to who you are. It's not what we're adding to them. It's almost what we're peeling away so they can get back to their authenticity and uniqueness. I do want to say, I love these acronyms. I actually shared this with a, a group of ninth graders. I was doing a stress management workshop yesterday. And if these acronyms help, uh, please, please utilize them. When working in integrated care or while working uh, on uh, master's degrees and beyond and all your certifications and so forth, uh, it is going to be important to be present and be in the moment. Um, there's one theory, and, and if you know me at all, I, I can I can get into the woo woo really hard. So so bear with me. But there is a theory that there uh, that everything that has happened or will happen is at one moment. Um, that may not be true, but I like the aspect of oh, when I'm present, I can access the openness of my eight-year-old self, the vitality and open-mindedness of my eight-year-old self, and also the wisdom of my 85 year old self. So I like that. Now, if you're not into that type of thought, what we do know scientifically, if you will, is that when we are present, we uh, allow ourselves to use more of our working memory and working memory is a critical component of overall intelligence. Those of y'all that will study intelligence testing, that's one of the domains we're measuring. And we know that regret and worry eat up working memory. It reduces our space, if you will. So I'm hoping throughout this presentation that you will practice that you'll stop, take a breath, observe, and then proceed. Observe what you're experiencing, maybe any thoughts, emotions, uh, biases that come up. We're going to pay attention to those. Um, and I also like the concept that we do this throughout the day because uh, you may have seen John Kabat-Zinn talk about this, who teaches about mindfulness, is that we don't want to start weaving the parachute when we are stressed. We want to be weaving that parachute day in and day out so that it will work when we do experience stress. So this is a stop as an acronym I like for us to continue. And particularly in, in integrated care settings, we're going to need to stop and make sure we're present frequently throughout the day so that we can be present for the medical providers we're working with, for our clients, for their family, for our other colleagues. These numbers, by the way, if you haven't seen them, were before COVID increases that we're noticing. Now, this was with college student samples, pretty large, not as diverse as we would like. I think it was about 70% white, 30% uh, uh, non-white, um, and I think more female than male. But so I'm sorry, I don't have all the norming data on that. But I, we probably are not going to disagree that we're seeing these levels of increases with severe depression up 34%, um, overwhelming anxiety. So not just simple anxiety, but overwhelming anxiety probably includes panic in here too. Have seriously considered suicidal, uh, suicide up 76%. I think we had our highest year of completed suicides or dying by suicides this year. Um that was on NPR. I don't have the data in front of me, so let don't quote that. But let's let's pay attention that this we have serious issues going on, and as such, we need very well trained and highly evolved um, behavioral health professionals that can help meet clients' needs, can help humanize the medical culture in the world. I think that's one of the biggest things we are. I may say this later, but it's worth repeating, or it's worth, it's worth saying it now, and maybe I'll repeat later. You're not only working with clients, you're system change agents for the medical professions in helping make them more person-centered. Um, I heard a great quote the other day that a part, this was from a physician, that one of their oaths, this is one I had not heard of, is to cure when possible, but to always comfort. To cure when possible and always comfort. 
And I've been fortunate to have really uh, sharp and kind uh, medical professionals that I work with. Uh, but I know that they uh, are, you know, are trained and there's such high volume they have to see. Oftentimes they only have 10 minutes with a, with a patient. We're going to call them clients throughout this uh, presentation, by the way. Um, so I see the uh, presence of a behavioral health profession in whether it's uh, oncology or a hospital or primary care or the emergency, emergency department as a force of being able to make it more person-centered. Okay. And it's obviously needed from these numbers that we see. Let me get some feedback from y'all. What is the difference? Um, I guess put this in the chat, but I we can talk as well, I, however you're more comfortable. But what's the difference between healing and curing? Is caring more like getting rid or, or banishing, like, or just um, taking away the cure? I mean, the like issue on hand, like if you know if they're depressed, so that's curing them, you know, taking away the depression as a whole instead of just trying to help them heal from it and work through it. Yeah, Victoria, you've, you've really hit the nail on the head there. Uh, the curing is about, oh, let's take away what's bothering you. And healing, we de we definitely don't want people to suffer, but healing also brings in this concept of let's look broadly at um, the systems that might be causing this, uh, the other aspects of our lives uh, that may need um, attention. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to bring on more symptoms that we're trying to cure. So I think it's helpful, and I and I do this with my students but is to think about this when you're working is the difference because we could actually heal into death. I think there's hospice workers that are doing this, that are helping people heal past traumas and, um, and see how they've grown and learned from all the different, uh, you know, abuses and inequalities and discriminations they've experienced. So healing can happen at any point of life. Curing is taking away that pain, it can be, it can be, not always short-sighted if we're not looking at the larger picture. Mm -hmm. So one mindset I'd always like to keep in mind is that difference, the healing versus the curing. And by the way, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of medicines uh, when they're used right for the right period of time with the right person. I would say the same thing about theories, which we'll discuss a little bit later for the right person at the right time at the right dose. Uh, so this is not at all an anti-medicine thing. When I worked in mental health, um, I saw people, uh, I was one of the folks who would monitor the people that were down at the state hospital in South, in South Carolina to see if they were ready to come back into the community, which is why uh, community mental health centers were developed back in the early 60s so that we could keep people from being warehoused in oftentimes what was called asylums. And um, it was helpful for me to be, uh, you know, looking at the folks that were ready to do that and ready to move back into the community and so that they could be with their family and be able to experience that. And Russ, I just love what's in the chat. Curing implies a sickness. Um, folks are just right with you talking about healing focuses on the process that it could be lifelong process. Healing's holistic versus symptom focused. Healing involves learning how to cope. Curing is removal or absolving of pain versus moving through pain. These are awesome. Oh, those are great. Thank you. Are you, I, yeah, go, you can move to the next slide, Kay, when you get a chance. Thank you. I, uh, I did want to say that uh, we have a new student and um, I asked her yesterday, she actually attended uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi and she definitely said I should ask y'all about the Blue Ghost and 
what's in the Whataburger sauce. So I don't know if that's something you want to post about Blue Ghost. And uh, we don't have Whataburgers up here in um, in the uh, North Carolina area that I'm aware of. Katie, are you aware of that? Or No, but I hear we need to get one. Everybody talks a lot about them. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I kind of want to, when we talk about healing and curing, I would say the medical model is oftentimes more focused on curing, even though there is this oath that I just learned about after all these years of being involved in the integrated care system of, of caring and so forth. But when you think about kind of a hierarchical hierarchical model and uh, maybe a deficiency-based model, even the term treatment plan can have kind of a deficit mind that I'm going to gather a bunch of data and then treat you versus, and, and so what we want to remember as students and as workers in integrated care is the client always comes first. The client for us also may be the medical providers that we're working with, not that we're providing counseling, but we're using every bit of our counseling knowledge and skills to build relationship with the providers we're working with, but client first and then problem second. And as much as possible, a treatment plan is collaborative. Katie's gonna to touch on why in a, a bunch of slides later. And also collaborative notes. Hey, what, what have we done that was meaningful today? Where do we wanna go? What, what is kind of your plan as you see it uh, from our meeting? So keep this in mind too as a mindset is, wow, treatment plan does kind of have is a power differential where collaborative treatment, collaborative notes is evening the playing field. And something we talk or that you see a lot of in feminist and relational cultural therapy is we need to even the playing field and be collaborators versus experts. Yeah, this is a brief video that I really liked. And, and just to give us kind of an overview of kind of the spirit and the essence of integrated care. Um, and it's also a great channel with some of the leaders of integrated care. If you want to just kind of make note of that, that they've got some other YouTube uh, videos out there. But yeah, let's take a look at this. Right. And Russ, if you'll just give me a thumbs up if you can hear the sound just to check. Okay. Yeah. You only have to be a primary care provider for one day to know that your physical health and mental health are inextricably linked. A lot of people say the majority of primary care is mental health related. I would go further, I'd say 100% of primary care is mental health related. No matter what you're seeing in the clinic, no matter what that chief complaint is, the patient's ability to deal with it and get better is gonna be dictated by their mental health. One of the things that was most evident about the health system is the fragmentation of it and the, the divided and siloed care and the way that that affects the patient. When the medical team and the behavioral health services are not together, we might not even target the needs. Maybe that patient is having a depression and that's why she's not adherent to the treatment. Integrating behavioral health into medical care truly elevates the standard of care. When you're in that clinic room, you're trying to figure out what you can do that day. And as a primary care physician, we don't have a lot of time. And when a lot of those things you realize actually are probably mental health related, it's literally a walk down the hall or a click of a button to send a message to our behavioral health team. As a behavioral health provider, when I go to that room, I am able to listen to that patient. We ask about family, social relations, emotions and our behaviors at home, those will impact our health. So I am able to go back to that medical provider and say, this is why she's not taking the medication. This is why she's not coming to the appointments. Hey, this patient might benefit from practice some relaxation exercises. We can also address nutrition. For me, I'm not just dispensing a medication to make this patient better, but we're actually looking at the whole picture. Because when you truly treat the whole patient, you have better outcomes. You have better mental health outcomes. You have better medical outcomes. You instantly see an elevation of not only the individual, but as a community. The patients usually are very grateful that we can work hand by hand 
with their medical provider and that we work as a team. Providing behavioral health services in an integrated care setting, we prevent other conditions to develop. We reduce costs and we have better outcomes in a timely manner. I want to see people happy. I want to see people mentally healthy. As a primary care physician, you are always asking yourself, have you done everything you could for these patients today? And I can honestly say, working in an integrated care model with behavioral health, I know that I have. Even though you're taught that you shouldn't take your patients with you in mind to your house, but it's inevitable. You're human and you touch a lot of life. Oh, nice. Okay. I, uh, I am curious from y'all, maybe you can comment uh, either in the chat or live. Um, the three points really stand out for me for that. I'm kind of curious what kind of, what kind of hit you, what stood out for you with that brief video? Um, I have one, this is Virginia. She was very intentional. Um, you know, to share how she does take her patients home with her. And I think after working in medical for 20 years on psych units, um, people don't share what they do, you know, whether they take it home, but you can kind of tell that they do because it was very stressful. And um, I thought that her appreciation of working with behavioral health is um, what I think so many want more of. I really do. Uh, if there, I worked with social workers, I'm a counselor, nurses, techs, physicians, residents in a teaching hospital. Yeah. And the main thing is there's not, didn't allow us enough time to appreciate each other. I, in our and have that. Yeah, and I appreciate that, uh, and not only of the the clients, uh, but of the your colleagues that you're working with as well. Um, Absolutely. But, in, and I, I yeah, I, I'm 100% with that, is that it, the healing that is brought by, be, by taking time to find out about relationships and finding out um, about career and career aspirations and all the types of things that a lot of times the primary medical providers don't have time to do that it's actually bringing healing into the medical world. And I like for us, I, as much as possible in classes, I like to talk about healing, not just counseling. Because a lot in your classes and the videos you watch, it'll be what you need to do more of and so forth. And what I'm hoping you'll get out of this is now I'm asking you to be who you are and find really effective ways to build relationships with everybody. Well, then I see some in the chat just noticing like there wasn't white coats and how much more personable that was and the acknowledgement that we can't always walk away from it, that we're human and that mental health can impact physical health, especially as you age. Yeah. Yeah, several times they mentioned, both of them mentioned uh, how it improved medical outcomes because we know depression is going to affect your desire to take your diabetes medicine. And so when we can help with that, we can kind of, whether it's medicine or going for walks or better nutrition, our mental health plays a huge role. Yeah. And talking about integrating systems help patients and clients feel more supported. My first job in integrated care was at a drop-in center. It was my first year out of my counseling degree. I was still provisionally licensed. And the drop-in center was a partnership from Washington University in Missouri and the community health agency where I work. So it was, it was really one room with a couple offices that had a psychiatrist, a nurse, a doctor, and then counselors and peer supports from this mental health agency. And one of the coolest things was we had a van and we did street outreach where we would go try to find folks in this urban um, area. So you often got partnered with the nurse or with the doctor and that connection that happened. And of course, that has not happened since that year that there was that level of connection with a provider or nurse or time. But I kind of hang on to it in this idea that um, 
all of the providers I work with are that person that I got to connect with and spend more time and joke with and ride with a van and learn what kind of music they like and what kind of fast food they were willing to run through to get, right? Or what their secret snack was. We just don't get that time. But holding on to that has really been helpful. That if there was more time and if there was a van, but knowing that that relationship with the people that you work with really is important and our clients feel it. They know when we're connected. They know when we respect the provider or think a provider's funny or whatever it might be. All right, Russ, did I skip a slide on you? I just want to share. I, did I skip this one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let, let's definitely talk about this. And this would be another chat too, um, or comments is, what are some evidence-based practices? Uh, or, or are you familiar with the term evidence-based practice? I see lots of nods. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, a lot of times in evidence-based practice, it's, uh, do we have a preponderance of research saying that this particular modality helps with a particular issue? An example may be cognitive behavioral therapy with depression and with anxiety. Uh, that would be an example of that. Interestingly, what I don't hear enough of, even though the preponderance of evidence, I, I would say this is uh, probably, there's probably more evidence supporting it than CBT. Uh, don't quote me on that. However, if it's not, it might be because of the grant funders are uh, only funding CBT type research. So I was reading about social determinants of health. And uh, one reason for the disparities might be that the grant funders, oftentimes, you know, maybe larger medical uh, community agencies and so forth, are not asking questions that allow us to see a broader perspective of such stuff as um, food deserts and so forth. But back to evidence-based practice, just be aware the therapeutic relationship is the single best indicator of client outcome. And I'm hearing more researchers talk about that even if they were to develop a new EMDR routine for trauma or a cognitive behavioral therapy for adolescent depression, that as a covariate, they also need to be monitoring the counselor-client relationship because it's so important for the other stuff to work is how well people relate to that, uh, to, to the person. But when we talk about evidence-based practice, what do we have a lot of published research supporting, okay? Uh, therapeutic relationship, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, uh, definitely uh, some good stuff for neurofeedback. Well, not as much neurofeedback, but for EMDR and so forth. Another term I want you to keep in mind is practice-based evidence, which is highly individualized treatment, incremental care with your client, find out after each session what's working, what's not working, how you can work better as a team, uh, collaborating together. We'll introduce a tool that can help with that. Katie's got a lot of experience with it later in the presentation. But keep in mind this term of practice-based evidence as, uh, as kind of a mindset term that we want to remember when we're working within systems and with our clients. What works for them at the right time, at the right dose uh, is important versus, and it's also important to have the research backing stuff up as well. But I'm a fan of qualitative research because I think it does get to that practice-based evidence. What did people find helpful? Okay, next slide. Well, maybe we're on quotes now. <laughs> yeah, just a couple quotes to keep in mind. Um, but at the time, the U.S. Surgeon General, there is no health without mental health. And I think our video uh, was indicating that as well. I was struck when he said 100% of what he does as a primary care physician is mental health. Also, a revision of the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take is, I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science and that warmth, sympathy and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. 
And I like to indicate this when I'm talking about integrated care because you don't typically hear it when you go to integrated care lectures and presentations or read it. But there is still the medical community, there's just uh, bright lights in the medical community that want to help. The systems can be sick at times. And we often can forget that this is a part of it. Katie, I believe that's you. All right. So if we're looking at these models and healthcare integration framework, right, that you'll really see that there's, we're not going to read every single one of these out loud, but this idea that we're all doing integrated care and that there are different ways to do integrated care, right? And jump in here with me, Russ. But um, yes, if we look at the very basic, like screening and follow-up, right? In my very beginnings of integrated care, we would refer somebody from a community health center to a primary care provider, and we would check our box that we referred them. And that was it, right? And we didn't have a system for even knowing like, well, did they go? Were they able to go? And so early on, just building in like, you know what, that's something that we feel like we could tackle. Like, can we truly see if somebody even wants to go versus just giving them the referral and really making sure that they followed up and being able to talk with them about how was that for you and what did you learn? So um, other screenings that started early on for me in integrated care were things like screening for tobacco use, where providers would ask people in a very motivational, interviewing, collaborative way, like, hey, have you ever thought about cutting back on your tobacco use? People almost always say yes, they've thought about it. So there's not this, let me talk down to you or tell you that it's not okay. And then they would simply ask, would you like to hear more about that? And if the person said no, then they would honor that and say, could I ask you about it another time? And Almost always the person would say yes. So just sort of building in this screening and follow-up there. And then you think about like these more evidence-based guidelines, like what do we know about the things that are really harming people that we can maybe serve more of a population with and things that might really be helpful. Um, early on, we, we did some um, adverse childhood events screening um, not just the screening, because if, if you know about ACEs and you're asking people about trauma, that can be a lot. So we paired the screening with also talking to people about their strengths, but we're able to start doing that with everyone and do some referrals. Um, that longitudinal model, like when, when can we start to be thinking about farther down the road or specific populations that we can really pay attention to over time? There's a clinic I work with that they really are looking at a group of folks that have some disordered eating, and they have a group of people that are following up on that. And then there's another clinic that looks at folks with depression and diabetes and really follows that population of folks there um, around culturally appropriate tools. Um, just two populations that some of the clinics I work with are looking at. Um, one was really around veterans and knowing that yes, there, where I live, there is a VA and then there's three hours for the VA. And three hours away is pretty far for folks. And for some of those folks, 30 minutes is far. And for some of them, 10 minutes is too far, right? Just depending on what their access level and how they're feeling about going to a VA is. So thinking really about that particular group of people um, and what we did, and this was like low hanging fruit. Can we all know a little bit about veterans a little bit more? And then also inviting people with lived experience to talk with all of our staff, including providers, about what it's like to be a veteran, what to keep in mind. Um, and then the last thing around really thinking about culturally appropriate tools. Um, one of the things we recognized in our area, which is a very rural area and prim prim primarily white, is that the um, number of BIPOC folks that were using our services did not match the BIPOC folks in our community. And so we got some grant funds specifically to look at that and also to do a focus group around the tools that we were using for screening and referral really were normed on people who were white. And so looking for more culturally appropriate tools to even support people in getting in the door. Um, and then I'll just share a little bit about number eight, which is sustainable billing. Like we all want something to pay for integrated care. We know that it pays for itself and it's really hard to do. So often you do figure out what you have to work with right now as you're working on a bigger plan. 
So I started in integrated care where we had a small grant that's going to run out in two years, right? And we did our best with it to learn what we could while we looked for other um, re revenues. And then we were able to partner with a, a smaller hospital network that really believed it saved money, even though they didn't have the tools to prove it at the moment. And so we had a, um, were able to put clinicians in clinics around that. Um, we partner with a university who has paid internships just for integrated care. So how do you get people in the workforce? And then um, at a state level, really advocating for this as we um, look at Medicaid expansion, with my, is particular to North Carolina, but just what your state you're in and how do you pay for these things? It is like an ongoing journey. Like in some ways, everybody knows it's the right thing to do, right? But it, it's really hard to find in certain states ways to make it sustainable. And so really being able to keep working on that and advocate both in your community, but at the state level has been pretty important. I would I would add one other thing. And I know you talked about kind of care team and, but I remember uh, talking with Katie and kind of comparing it to my experience with staffings is Katie and I both have an interest in positive psychotherapy. And just being able to, when we do have care team meetings, of being able to also talk about the strengths and um, encourage that. So as a part of the behavioral health profession, we've talked about kind of healing and, and bringing more of a person-centered mode into the medical world. But that's also, as busy as these staff meetings can be, is also being able to share some successes that you've had in the past month. Because uh, oftentimes, it, for those of you that are working in mental health, you know, you're only hearing about the things uh, that don't go well mm -hmm. or uh, all of the needs because the needs are vast and we're always underfunded. But I appreciate that aspect of being able to intentionally share what's gone well or a success that you've had. Thanks for that, Russ. I'm thinking of a clinic where um, the clinician so didn't want to bother the providers that she only went to them if she absolutely needed to, right? But then those absolutely needed to moments were no one's favorite moments. They usually had some urgency and can you squeeze this person in? Um, and she was really able to, to shift back from that and start small with telling the provider like, oh, hey, I meant to tell you this person said they loved your joke. And there was a provider who loved to use puns. So Russ, you would have liked that provider. But being able to just mention these small things and then certainly client progress and successes started to build that relationship. Yeah. So as mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we're all doing integrated care. Even if you're in a sole person private practice, you're referring folks probably to medical professionals or you have relationships with medical professionals. Uh, and so just keeping in mind that there's all different types of level of integration. Um, coordinated would be a system to where um, maybe as well, what we just talked about is that you do have relationships with medical providers, you as a behavioral health provider that you can refer folks to or that you can help people get to a federally qualified health center if needed and if, if they don't have funding or insurance and so forth. Co-located would be a situation to where uh, a behavioral health provider is located within a medical practice, but it's not fully integrated. So they, they're renting or leasing an office and there is some um, collaboration but not full collaboration. Uh, and uh, I would th that does allow for this type of teamwork uh, that's needed, but it could also be a situation I was thinking about where um, you're in the same office park. So you're around the medical professions frequently. They know who you are. They know you have an office and so forth. That would be more kind of a co-located. And then fully integrated would be a situation, let's see, are we going to yeah, it is kind of what we were seeing with the video where we've got um, the psychologist working with the primary care physician within the same office is up and about, is not just hold up in their office, is up and about, it can come in at a moment's notice to meet a patient. Uh, that would be what's full integration. But we're all doing this at some level, all doing integrated care at some level. Um, university uh, health centers are typically pretty integrated. Um, I know here at, uh, at Western Carolina University, 
the medical folks are downstairs, unfortunately, and um, but there's still a lot of communication, appropriate communication, where folks can just refer up and down the stairs, uh, and they can even come down to visit. At UNC Asheville, which is uh, our program's located in Asheville, actually, at UNC Asheville, it is a full integrated uh, uh, treatment or, or center for the students. So you see this a lot in um, in kind of university settings. And if you don't ever go use that, it might be helpful just to, to go in to kind of see how they do it. I I yeah, and this is this is a good slide, but I should also say um before I forget, with non-target, some of the models of integrated care, and this would be more fully integrated, are non-targeted or horizontal. And a trend that we were seeing is more school-based health centers, so K through 12 health centers, where you not only, we have school nurses, but you not only have the nurse, but then you've got a clinical mental health counselor that's a part of that situation. And as well as maybe a PA or a nurse practitioner that's doing a little bit more comprehensive health care. So this has been identified that in order for kids to learn and thrive and achieve, they have to have good health. And even though that can be recommended by a principal or administrator, it's oftentimes just not accessible um, due to a lot of the things Katie's talked about, whether it's transportation, funding, access to insurance, um, fear of the medical profession. So we're seeing that, and that would be a good example of kind of non-targeted. All students can kind of get their medical care needs met. Um, non-targeted are gonna serve a broad array of, of clients, um, kind of population focus. So non-targeted might be a primary care uh, uh, office that always screens for depression and maybe one other uh, behavioral health need, maybe anxiety, maybe addiction. Uh, that can actually help qualify them for a higher level of being a primary care medical home. I believe if they are at a higher level of primary care medical home, they can uh, receive more funding. Uh, so most of them are striving to do that. My my docs, uh, one doc would always ask when I go in there yearly, uh, the CAGE questions, which we're going to talk about, about related to kind of addiction. And uh, my current doc at, does the PHQ-9. So every year when I go in, I get the PHQ-9 and we can talk about that. Uh, which Oh, I'm sorry. The patient health questionnaire nine is about depression and you'll be introduced to that if you haven't already. So that's one of the tools you'll walk away with. Okay, next one. Yeah. And, you know, one other thing I would say about non-targeted, a site that I supervise with, I supervise our students, is a Mountain Area Health Education Center. They have a, a, a family or a practice, and they have several behavioral health professionals. It's also a teaching uh, model, so they've got residents in there. And so a behavioral health professional can sit in the consulting room. And anytime a doc needs them, they can kind of come grab them. Hey, can you please meet this uh, client to see if you can provide some education and support? But they also have clients, and it's more virtual now, or, or behavioral health professionals that are seeing the clients for 50-minute sessions. So it's like one day they might be in the consult room and, and working the rounds a lot, but then the next day they're really doing um, kind of what we would consider more traditional mental health, 50-minute sessions. So just some examples of that. There's all different types of integration. The targeted, I had the opportunity when I worked in, I'm a, when working on my doctorate, my last internship was in a hospital. I was in the patient um, cancer support unit. I was not at Wake Forest. It was actually another hospital um, uh, at in Winston-Salem. And my name, and my name, it, the name's leaving me. But I actually had privileges to work out to see people in the cardiology unit or even the emergency department, but I spent most of my time on the oncology unit. And that would be more targeted, is that we're providing kind of specific care. At Wake Forest, their, um, their integrated care setting within their uh, oncology unit, they would talk to um, family. Family could come in to talk about what they're experiencing, the grief. There was relationship counseling, people going through, you know, tremendous treatment for 
cancer and how this affects relationship, even as much as uh, helping people get fitted for wigs if needed after receiving chemotherapy. So that's more of an example of kind of targeted treatment. And then reverse integration, I, uh, Katie's been involved in all types of integration, but I put Meridian Behavioral Health in Waynesville where she works because they actually had a primary care physician working within the office a couple days a week to help meet these medical cares. So uh, again, just one other version of integrated care that you could work in. And like my mental health agency was very comprehensive. We had psychiatrists uh, which are medical doctors. And I'd like to give one example that was incredibly helpful. Um, I may be jumping a little bit, but it's worth mentioning now is one of my clients, I was working with severe and persistent mentally ill clients. Uh, he suffered from uh, or, or experienced paranoid schizophrenia at times. It was pretty well managed. But one day, and I and I did home visits, so I met with him uh, and a family member uh, roughly once a month. Uh, he was pretty stable at the time. And uh, I remember one time he came into, his family brought him into the, the mental health center, the mental health center, and uh, I, he didn't have an appointment, so I didn't know what was going on. And he was uh, experiencing, uh, he was not coherent. Uh, not making a lot of sense with his words, a uh, little bit stumbly, kind of unbalanced. And um, the medical of oh, the psychiatrist who always had her stethoscope and, and blood pressure cuff and all that kind of stuff, listened to his lungs, uh, took his blood pressure, did kind of the medical work and recognized that he was suffering from some type of medical condition. Well, it wound up being pneumonia. So she sent him immediately to her, to the, actually it was to the emergency department because this was serious. And within, uh, it was within a couple of weeks, he was fine. Uh, they treated him, the pneumonia disappeared. He had still been taking his mental health medication for schizophrenia um, because that's kind of what it looked like is maybe the, me the medication wasn't working anymore or maybe he forgot it or whatever. And one thing I always think about it, it had a tremendous impact on me as I had been down since I was kind of a coordinator with the uh, the state hospital where people went for acute care. I was like, had he gone down there with pneumonia and we thought it was relapsing schizophrenia, would he have gotten the care he needed? Now, there were great people down there, but it was very crowded. And so that's one thing that all, that really kind of hit home for me with integrated care is, wow, I'm so glad I worked with a physician who was able to detect that this was physical health and get him the proper care that he needed. Just a couple, and I know in your classes, you will be talking about um, the different research that's out there. So I kind of wanted to just highlight um, that there's a lot of ongoing research. Um, we know that uh, it improves access to care, especially for children, to be able to receive mental health care within a primary care practice. Uh, improves client satisfaction with the care they get. Uh, I think we could see that from the video or, or at least kind of glean that, wow, I, people are wanting to know more about me than just my symptoms would improve client satisfaction. Um, I was particularly uh, with, with one of the Texas colleagues down here, that's a great study that was done and published in the Journal of Counseling and Development, significant improvement in quality of life of SPMI clients versus treatment as usual. So versus uh, mental health care treatment for folks with severe mental illness, when it was coordinated in a fully integrated setting to where they could get all of their care needs met, uh, that it was significant improvement. So I know you're going to be getting a lot of the research. I just wanted to point out, and then a couple, let me give you some, not anecdotal, but the next slides will help us look at stuff that was really relevant. I do not know that this was ever published. This was from a PowerPoint from an integrated care conference uh, here in the area. And this was shared with me. I was not at that conference. But what they found, Galj and Palaha, Palaha uh, was that by having a, say, let's say, a counseling intern in the primary care office just once a week, so a practicum or an internship, 
created over uh, $1,100 in additional revenue. And the way that that was created was that the when the primary care physician was working with somebody who was experiencing depression or maybe suicidal ideation or panic disorder, they could make sure they had their medical needs met and the medicine needs met, and then go get the counseling that they needed and the psychoeducation and the support and also the follow-up. So what they found is by the doc still being able to uh, <laughs> spend less time, they could bill more money by seeing more clients, which more than paid for. It, it came up to a revenue of, uh, let's see here. Oh, it came up to a revenue of about 50, uh, over $55,000 a year. Uh, because it saved the physician uh, time that they could be able to uh, refer those folks out in-house, in-house to get the care they needed. Katie, I think you had a good story about uh, whether it's a stroke or anxiety. What was that from you years ago? That was. Oh, I know who you're talking about for sure. We had okay. a primary care doctor that that came a couple days a week and. Um, really was trying to see our folks who um, often didn't follow up with primary care, needed more than a primary care could provide as far as number of appointments, or maybe had even been fired by every local primary care provider who just didn't want to see them anymore. And there was a, a client and man, she was spitfire. Like she was funny, boisterous, um, had a lot of energy. She was an older woman but she also went to the ER all the time with anxiety. But when she went to the ER, guys, she would show up and all of a sudden she looked 90 instead of her 75 years old. And she got quiet and she was very sweet. And she would say with her anxiety, like, I can't breathe and I can't really feel part of my face. Right. And of course, every time she walked into the ER and often there wasn't the same providers there like the picture that they're seeing is this could be a stroke and they would go through the whole piece and they really felt like they couldn't not do that. Um, and as counselors, we were trying every intervention we could like trying to have her call the crisis line first. And we would try to call the ER and we would try to make plans with the ER team. Um, and this is before we had our primary care provider who after this happened quite a bit and several failed attempts to like asked the ER to do something we thought they should do. And they were uncomfortable with um, uh, us saying like, we're, it's anxiety. Cause what do I know? I don't want to be wrong. I'm not a doctor, right? About anxiety versus a stroke. But our um, primary care provider, his name was Dr. Teeter. He had his phone up and I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm ordering a pulse ox on Amazon for $20. Um, and so it turned out he ordered this little pulse ox that you can clip on your finger. And he helped create this plan with her and then doc to doc at the ER, because that's who they needed to talk to. They made this plan that if she showed up in the ER while she was still in the lobby, because there's some red tape about once you check in, that she would call our crisis line. We would walk her through using the pulse ox. We would consult with him and she wouldn't end up going back into the ER where she didn't need to go. And then we could help her practice what we know about what supported her around anxiety and it would avoid this ER trip. And she went from 50, 50, in one year, she went to the ER 50 times. And the next year she only went to the ER 12 times, which is still 12 times, but that is a significant difference in cost and price um, and how she was treated. And all of the time we all spent spinning, trying to figure out how to support her in a better way. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. A couple more slides and then maybe we'll take just a brief five minute break just so we can stand and stretch and do what we need to do. But um, this was another example of, uh, and, and actually a student shared this with me um, and gave me permission to share that he was experiencing tightness in the chest, shortness of breath. It's a very similar story to what Katie shared. And, um, and then uh, had all these types of medical imaging, which needed to happen, at least some of them needed to happen, uh, the ER visits and stress tests and so forth. According to him, now I realize memory is tricky and, uh, you know, we remember different things, but according to him, through all the different tests, he was never asked about mental health issues and it did wind up being anxiety. 
it wound up being anxiety. So he was going through kind of the stress of all the medical procedures and, and imaging and so forth. And then once he finally got a counselor and was able to talk and, uh, uh, you know, learn skills, mindfulness and different types of stress reduction, it helped considerably. So just wanted to kind of give you something to consider that. Uh, yeah. A quick screening would have gone a long way. <laughs> This is not Nadine Burke, by the way, Dr. Burke. This is not Dr. Burke. I did not have a public domain image uh, for her, but uh, is a real hero and leader in integrated care. And um, I love this quote. Hey, would one of y'all be willing to read this quote for us? I think it's important. I would love to see a treatment protocol that says, you know, this child has a history of interurine intrauterine drug exposure and domestic violence. Okay, let's start with 12 weeks of biofeedback overlaid with one year course of inside oriented therapy and go from there. Thank you. And also if I had known the word intrauterine was, I wouldn't have asked, <laughs> that's a tough one for me, but thank you for reading that, yes. Um, that it'll just become a part of the medical community that we're actually asking uh, uh, or, or prescribing, if you will, behavioral health treatment. And, and I'm very grateful for Dr. Burke's leadership in the integrated care movement. I am curious about something. Um, maybe uh, maybe if we can talk about this and then then we'll take a quick break. Like one of the things with behavioral health professionals what are your insecurities of working within with medical providers or medical settings? Um, or do you have any insecurities uh, related to that work? I see Audrey's got her hand up. Yeah, hi, yes. good morning. Thank you so much for this uh, symposium. So at least for me, I've had a number of different medical issues. And one of the things I've ran into is doctors that have a horrible bedside manner. Um, and they're just really rude and they're chart turners and they're trying to get patients in and out of their office just to get the number of insurance claims under their belt so they can make a lot of money that day. Um, they won't read my labs to me or explain what they mean. They'll say, follow up with your PCP or whatever, where I've had to change my doctor team um, because of just the terrible bedside manner. Um, and I've even had it with counselors where I got assigned release of information from the client to talk to another provider and the other provider says, no, I don't need to talk to you. That's fine. And so even though that's part of our ethical code, right. To, to make that effort and do that, I have ran into other providers that don't want to talk to me, even though I'm trying to do that right thing. Yeah. Katie, how have you navigated that? Uh yeah, I know no, you've talked about it. Yeah, yeah, and Audrey, that's just real. Thank you for being willing to share that. That's just so hard, and I, I think if if we're the behavioral health professional there, like the first thing I have to do is kind of wonder, like, what's happening for that provider, just to get my own compassion scale up, so I can <laughs> stay in the game. I wouldn't expect that from the patient, right? But mm -hmm. um, knowing, like, there, what is all of that pressure on these providers that they're kind of going into like checkout, right? They're Mm -hmm. just putting their head down to get it done. So for me, I have to start there. And then if I was supporting a client, I, you know, I would wonder if there's anything I could do to help, whether that's I'm meeting with them 10 minutes before and 10 minutes after, cause I know it's going to be hard. Maybe I'm being real. And I'm saying like, Hey, Russ, I want to be real doctor. So, and you have to do it in the most respectful way. Right. But that's also genuine. Like Dr. So-and-so is very busy and you might find that he's not really able to connect like other people might be. Or I might even say, I can think of a, a client where I said like, you are really good at connecting with people. You have that skill, the way that you ask people questions and make eye contact. Like you mm -hmm. might have that skill better than this provider does. And just so that they're not set up. Um, and maybe even that would be a great place for them to practice some tools. Like, hey, let's be real about what is it like for you to be in this doctor's appointment? Do you feel anxious? Do you feel small? Do you feel like you can't remember what you wanted to ask and then help them really have tools mm -hmm. writing down their questions or man, they're just going to notice their feet on the floor when it doesn't feel good 
to really set the stage so we don't really set people up. So I know that doesn't fix what you're sharing, which is real and part of a system problem, um, but it's a great chance to partner with a client um, in what they're really facing. And of course, if that was, if they're driving the car, right? And if they are mm. like, I don't like this provider, then we could have a conversation about is there someone else? And you and I both know there's not always somebody else, right? With right. all the hoops there, but to really, then maybe they're feeling like, oh, wait, I am choosing this in some way because it's important to me or part of my goals or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yeah. any of that resonates for you, Audrey. Yeah, it does. And I think that that's a big piece of what I do with clients because they forget that they're the consumer, right? Like you're yeah. the, you're the consumer of the service. And so it's, you getting service from a provider. And so be assertive and voice what you need. And that's a big part of what I do with a lot of the clients that I see in private practice. So thank you for your response. Thank you, Audrey. And, and Katie, there's a couple of things in the chat that maybe you can touch on here. One is uh, I'm insecure about being a young looking woman and being considered a professional uh, with worthwhile expertise. And uh, there was a couple that kind of resonated with that, like maybe not knowing fully what you're offering as a behavioral health professional. Um, I, I didn't know if maybe you had something to share. Um, yeah, that was my MO, looking young for too long. I hope that's still the problem, but no one has told me that lately. <laughs> so no, I think that's real. And uh, um, I think one, like it's okay to name that when it is real, like a patient will say like, how old are you anyway? And to be to really share with a, a client, like, you know what, that's fair. Tell me what you're worried about. This is your health. Like, that's okay to ask about that. So there's that piece. Um, I also do think some provide, like to know that when, when you are young and new, like sometimes that means we're like open to learning a little bit more than maybe someone else will. So own the strengths of appearing young. Um, you know, take in some settings, I might take a risk and name it with a provider. Hey, I know I look young. If you ever think that that is cause for concern for a client, let me know. In other settings, I might not say that. And I'm going to like bring my, the best I can bring my confidence to the table and be clear about what we do know, because we do have tools and skills. And I always fell back on um, what I learned as a graduate student, which that the relationship does matter. And that often the years of experience of a clinician does not show up in the outcomes, right? So like, what can I control is, am I being present? Am I putting the relationship first? Am I collaborating? And that those things do show up in outcomes. And I, um, I appreciate it. Can I chime in real quick? I, yeah, I yeah, apologize. please. Um, on Audrey, I, I can piggyback off of her on that part of, I had um, thyroid issues for almost five years and I was trying to tell my uh, PCP, you know, I feel like I'm going crazy. So I was going to, you know, they sent me to a, um, a counselor and the counselor was like, okay, well, I see your medical history and I don't see anything, you know, really wrong with you. So they were prescribing me every medication you can think of. And I was getting worse. And the PCP made me feel like I was drug seeking because you know, of course, when your thyroid goes bad, your um, attention, your just everything is horrible. And so she really made me feel really insecure about having an issue. And finally, I did like a history back. I asked my mom, you know, does she have any issues? And she mentioned thyroid and she was getting a scan. So I told my my uh, primary care about it. And she decided to look at my labs for my um my thyroid um, levels. And I actually had bad thyroid levels for about three years and she never double checked. So I think that communication and, and additional education uh, for PCPs and BC, um, behavior, uh, BHCs to try to listen to their um, patients a little bit more whenever they are really telling them I have an issue I am not a drug seeker I'm really wanting to go crazy and they put you to the side because the communication is not there or the labs are not done right because even though the labs were there no one was looking at them correctly so that that disconnect had me going crazy for years <laughs> and I had to be yeah. my own advocate on that part but a lot of people don't know that right yeah, I just so appreciate you sharing that. I think that's real. And I think in our 
settings where there's a counselor that joins a practice, that stuff is happening, right? And that that is where over time, those things really can improve, whether it's stigma or not listening or a busy provider that hasn't been able to look through the whole chart. And one of the things, and Russ jumped in here that I've seen really helpful is when you have a practice that's willing to get together, even it's quarterly, and they do look at a client study, because then it doesn't feel threatening. It's like looking out here. Um, and often the behavioral health person was was able to like bring one of those and to do it in a way that I'm asking questions of their provider so that yeah. we're all learning together has been really powerful. But um, I know that doesn't make it better for the person that experienced that for sure. And, and I come back to uh, the more we can get to know and use our good counseling skills to get to know the providers, and I'm talking as behavioral health professionals, the more they can start to actually listen and trust us. Because a lot of medical providers are just trained in a, it's, it's more you know in volume, because there is such volume of people to treat. Once they can start to trust you, and we're not coming at it from, a, oh, I know more than you, we're doing like what Katie said, we're being inquisitive, we're asking questions uh, about lab works or about what's been done. Um, one thing you will become, <laughs> many of you will become excellent physicians working in integrated care. You're going to learn a lot about medicine and a lot about physical illnesses, and good physicians become a lot better behavioral health professionals working within integrated care. Again, it kind of comes to the relationship. I will say we probably need to move on and I'm not gonna take a break, but I encourage you to, if you need to, because I am looking at what we wanna cover in our time period. So we'll just kind of keep moving forward. Thank you for this engagement. We really appreciate that. Hey, I'll pull this up, Russ. And um, I think we've told some stories, so feel free to move me on. I know we have some slides that help us give more examples. Yeah. I think we, can, we shared a little bit about um, that person. Um, this slide is really just an example of how integrated care might work around a medication project. Um, we were asked to support a practice um, to provide a clinician where there had been several providers in the community that had retired and were frankly prescribing um, a lot of opiates and benzos together when maybe it would have been contraindicated and there was high amounts of overdoses. And so they were really looking at a way to support that practice um, as people had been on these medications for years. And you can imagine how difficult it could be for anyone to suddenly hear that and to feel scrutinized as a client when someone's saying, hey, this what we've been doing is not what we want to do. We need to change your medication. Um, and so this was really a joint effort of really looking at each person individually, what the plan was, what their options were, whether that was a long-term taper, whether that was they really needed a referral for substance use specific treatment, because that was the fear, whether this is someone who was so scared to come off their medications because they had so much anxiety or trauma that they needed some more um, therapy or CBT or trauma, or whether they needed some a Suboxone referral. And of course, I list all those options as if there were plenty of resources and they're not, that's just, but really thinking about what are the options that we have and how can we um, figure out what people might need and collaborate with them as much as a voice. And um, I make up that were, had they not reached out to have a behavioral health person there to really be a part of that team, that that experience for patients who were suddenly told that their medications needed to change would have been very different. Um, and because we were able to do that project, um, it was supposed to be short term, one year, that, that they started to see, oh, wait, we can be really helpful to providers. And that turned into a permanent place and there's still a, a clinician there. Um, and that just leads me to just share that there's a behavioral health component to everything, right? And I really thought um, when we started looking at integrated care like we saw in the video, like placing a clinician in a clinic. We had five counties and we're going to put a clinic in each county clinic, um, a primary care office. I had this idea that we were all going to do the same thing and that it was going to look the same and everybody would create the same processes. If you're laughing at me, that's fine because I'm laughing at my <laughs> younger self as well. And it really just looked very different in each one. And now I've learned like to be okay with that. 
And it's kind of this beautiful art piece that happens. Not that it's easy, but there was one clinic where they really started with every client who had a lot of mental health stuff. Like all of the providers, they were like, oh, thank God you're here. We want you to see so-and-so. And we saw it very quickly that it was who they considered, unfortunately, to be called a problem patient. And I also want you to let, you know, they don't say that anymore. Like having this clinician there, they really can say it differently. Um, and this clinician worked so hard for a long time to try to get other referrals. Like she would say, hey, can I see who's on your list today? Maybe I could see this person. And it was a real struggle until one day she played a game where she brought a M&M machine to work and they have a five minute standing meeting. And she had everybody share about one client that was coming, one client that was coming in today to see the doctor and what the situation was. And the people had to guess what's the behavioral health component. And then they got to turn the handle on the M&M machine and see how, how many M&Ms they got. And what really shifted it was someone who had no joke, like rolled their ankle, was coming in, but that person was somebody that exercised for their like mental well-being. And that started this conversation with them where they started to see how there wasn't really a patient that she could not interact with that would not be helpful for. Um, so candy does work. Food does work. Sometimes that's what we're doing to introduce ourselves to the behavioral health providers. Um, there was another clinic that had five providers and no joke, we ran the numbers. 97% of the referrals came from one provider. There was a champion provider and that's how it started. Like there was someone who had buy-in. So that's where we started. Another clinic um, had, there was a provider had came from an academic institution and was really like, so what's the process here? Like they just assumed it would look like integrated care. So we started with them and there was a pediatric clinic that was like so overwhelmed by every parent's um, ask for ADHD medication. Like they're like, we don't even know what to do all of this, that having starting there where it was like, we do, let's create a process flow where we're going to do an assessment and that we're really going to think about what has been tried. We'll communicate with the school for you and get that information. We'll provide parent support and skill building. And the provider can make the call of where along that journey is medication appropriate with some input. So just wanted to share that this can show up in very different ways. And that um, what I've learned is like, you have to be patient to start wherever the light is or whether there's wh wherever there's interest or momentum and to trust that over time, people will start to see the buy-in but there will be those awkward beginnings if you're starting in somewhere new where people don't get it yet. Um, and that's okay, right? I think that that's probably true of the counseling field, that not everybody bought in or has bought in yet, right? And these are just some questions about like whatever level of integration we're at, which might just be our integration is that we're in private practice and we have a person who we know is a whole person. What are we doing to just be curious, ask questions, um, and asking these both of the people that we serve and also of ourselves. In keeping in mind in the initial meetings that to just be curious about people, uh, to express that interest is healing. It's not a box to be checked. It's not like, oh, I've got to have this as a part of the treatment plan, the intake, or the initial meeting. That being innately curious in people is healing in itself. And again, I tie that back to the video that we saw of having people to ask about relationships, partners, careers, uh, career aspirations, and so forth. So from a mindset perspective, be aware that every interaction can be healing if we're truly interested in getting to know people. And Katie, I don't, I'm looking at time and I'm kind of curious, I'm wondering if we would want to save this until the end, if we have time, because we have a case study and skills and so forth. So maybe we save this to the end or would you be really disappointed? I would not be really disappointed if you didn't play a video of me, yeah, but you can find it if you would <laughs> like to later. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Yeah, and this is just a video that shows how how conversational and collaborative an assessment can be or an intake can be. So a couple of things to keep in mind too from skills when working with clients is, is more from a solution focused perspective. So if any chance you get to watch videos with Insu Kenberg in particular and her partner, Steve DeShazer, um, 
both have now passed on, but I had the fortunate opportunity to see them in a workshop uh, back in the early 2000s. But just from a mindset perspective of, again, as I talked about, the medical model world can be a little bit deficit-minded as somebody with a problem that we've got to treat and be thinking about how we're thinking about clients and maybe the language we're using. So for those of you who've had theories and techniques or those of you who will, the idea behind solution focus is that we kind of maintain our narrative based on what we're telling ourselves, which is it's hard to break. Uh, if we're raised in uh, discrimination and oppression and abuse, that becomes kind of the narrative and it's very difficult to break. We need to work on it on a systemic level and as behavioral health professionals, help people see that there's other ways of seeing. So some ways of doing this is, uh, you know, instead of tell me about your problem, what would you like to change? We will hear about the problem from what we'd like to change, but we're also getting them to shift perspective to what's gonna be better. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but how can I help you? How will you know that this session today was helpful? Okay, we've got 20 minutes. This is a brief visit. How will you know this will be helpful? I want you to get what you need. Uh, I do like this as the problem or symptom in, of an underlying issue. Is it a result of an underlying issue? How about differently? Can we dig deep to discover solutions? Okay. And what childhood or societal events have helped build your resilience? Or where have you learned post-traumatic growth, even in the midst of uh, unfair systems and so forth? So just from a mindset perspective, be thinking along the lines of solution-focused as a way to start looking at what are the possibilities and not just a deficit mindset. As a person of privilege, as we talked about earlier, uh, uh, many of you, will, you'll be practicing this, you'll be taking classes, uh, but constantly, this is a lifelong process for me, I know. Uh, Katie's currently in a class. We get a lot of training at our school and program, but learning who we are, our cultural identity, being able to ask for that, this is where the broaching uh, video I found on y'all on with TechShip was, fantastic. And I'm going to be sharing this with students that Char Newton led, obviously an expert, asking at intake or initial meeting people's experience with bias and discrimination and immigration issues and concerns, asking about their existential and spiritual issues. Very first paper I published back in the late 90s because it was uh, related to the spiritual and existential issues because I found working in mental health if I didn't ask clients about religious or spiritual beliefs, that you could tell there was just something missing um, and that that helped build rapport and relationship and get conversation flowing. It was fine for people not to have any beliefs, but just to make them aware that that can be a part of this conversation. Uh, other questions I got from the cultural formulation inter interview and uh, there's, yeah, but are there any aspects of your background or identity that make your, uh, that make a difference to your problem? And also tell me about times you felt misunderstood by healthcare providers. And is there anything we together can do to make this a better experience? So for me, it's helpful just to be reading over this regularly, talking about it. So I'm aware of my own biases uh, and shortcomings and fragility, which comes up frequently, and uh, but making that this is a part of the counseling process, clearly. Social determinants of health, and I want to give you an example here. We know that 80% of people's health and health-related issues are caused by social determinants, such as socioeconomic, education, employment, family support, community safety, their behaviors, tobacco, diet and exercise, alcohol and drugs, sexual activity, and environment, air, water quality, housing, and transit. An example we have in North Carolina, I don't know the outcome of this, but there's been an interesting thing that happened recently, is in a neighborhood north of Charlotte, there was a... Um, a higher than likelihood uh, uh, incidence of neurological cancer, of brain cancer. And I didn't know this at the time, but apparently cancer 
typically doesn't start in the brain. It can metastasize to the brain, but it doesn't start. But they were having a high percentage in this particular community and also a higher percentage than normal of depression. What they did, people from Duke University came down, they started exploring. Beside this neighborhood was a, a factory that produced asphalt and were releasing uh, the, I'll just call them toxins, into the air, the pollution into the air. And they tracked kind of the plume and it went over this neighborhood and um, very tough to prove. But uh, what I think about with this is that, wow, I could have been working with somebody who's experiencing depression. We could have been using cognitive behavioral therapy and all different types of relaxation and mindfulness skills and uh, activation skills when the actual issue was that they were breathing polluted air. The state then said, well, we need to have precedence for this. They actually came into the area near where Katie and I lived, where there was a huge paper factory, because they found that the chemicals being released were similar to what was being released with the asphalt. In that same spot, they also found that there were higher than likelihood cases of depression. I don't know about the cancer, although I do know of a situation that was unusual uh, that happened there. But interestingly enough, just a few months ago, that plant, the one in Waynesville, the paper plant closed without uh, without much explanation at all as to why. Uh, so just the reason we want to always remember social determinants of health is that this is a major impact on uh, how we think, feel and behave in, uh, in the world. And we don't want to just think everything psychological if it's depression when it actually could have been from the polluted water they're drinking. And physicians, if they notice this, have to report. Uh, they report to whatever board it is, to the uh, probably the public health facility. Um, but as behavioral health professionals, we need to pay attention to that as well, is what needs to be investigated. Racial injustice in health. Uh, this is probably uh, nothing new to you, but the allostatic load, allostatic load is essentially the wear and tear of the body of the constant fight or flight response. Um, maybe you've heard of that. And you think about an example I think about is in Alabama, the two largest, uh, it may have been Birmingham, two largest high schools uh, were named after Confederate leaders. I don't know if they still are. And so if I'm a person of color and I'm walking into this house named and probably a mascot similar, perhaps, um, that's that constant fight or flight, even if I don't consciously recognize it, like I'm used to it. So some ways to reduce uh, the, the racial injustice in health and help improve this, renaming the schools, building sports teams, military bases, some of that's happening, taking down monuments, working on equal pay, because we do know that discrimination, um, let me make sure I've got this, uh, certainly exacerbates depression, again, with the fight or flight. Telomeres, uh, maybe I'm not going to go into great detail, but just telomeres, if you think about it as you've got your DNA, which is in your genes, which is then makes up your chromosomes, and the telomeres are kind of like the plastic shoelace casing of your chromosomes. And the more stress you experience, the more they get worn down, very similar to a shoelace until you can no longer use it because the shoelace is all frayed. What we do know is that uh, increased fight or flight response from this type of discrimination and oppression does decrease the telomerized levels and essentially ages us more quickly. Um, creating more, and this can also, we know from uh, discrimination, more inflammation in the body, which is never particularly helpful. Uh, and that also with the, the short allele, we're born with that. We can be born with a short allele, making us more at risk for anxiety and depression, but the environment turns on whether that's going to be harmful or not. So just some more wording on the types of work we can do as advocates to help make sure that we're improving the health of BIPOC populations. And I think integrated care is a great way for this because people that would never go to a mental health center often do have to go get their medical needs attended to. 
uh, even if it's just to be on a, a physical, to be on a sports team, or if it's to um, take care of obstet obstetrics type of work and so forth, that then they can be introduced to the fact that we have behavioral health professionals that are here to help as well. This is just to remind us to think broadly. Again, I would say a mindset skill, think broadly. A lot of times anxiety, in the, and particularly in the medical profession, is narrowly defined as worry and obsessive thoughts and the inability to relax. And I want us to be able to think very broadly. It could be anxiety can be the result of all of these, but an existential theory would talk about anxiety as a result of an imbalance. We're not in the right career or relationship. Feminist theory talks about how social injustice, inequality, everything we've talked about living in a white cisgendered male heteronormative belief system with all their policies causes anxiety. Could be hypersensitivity, light, sound, noise, texture. Uh, from a social perspective, uh, Ayurvedic medicine, Native American uh, philosophy, Asian philosophy of energy and the energy we get from people and we feel can affect us proprioceptive, our own internal awareness. So again, just keeping a very broad view to be able to think differently when we're doing good integrated care work and not be narrowly defined. Okay. Briefly, this is something my students and I have fun with. As you enter the field and we talk about specific techniques, uh, we've been talking about mindset a lot, but as we talk about techniques, we had fun creating this. Be thinking about, are you seeing your client's inherent wellness so clearly that the client understands they're more than just their issues? That would be fire. <laughs> A student recently told me that they call this the litmus test. So is that lit? Because again, as we talked about, as we learn more and more, and I think more are going to be coming to light of the systems that cause inequality and discrimination, it can be very hard not to, um, uh, just for that to drag us down and not be able to see the light and the beauty in each one of our clients. So uh, if, this, if this kind of funny chart helps you, I just want you, when you're in session with a person, whether you're working with a, a medical provider or your client, Remember to breathe and to ask yourself, hey, am I really seeing this person's worth? This person's worthy of respect. And am I seeing that? Uh, and so just pay attention to that one if you can. In fact, there is some evidence uh, that our intention towards others actually causes a physiological response. I'll point, I'll just read this. Whereas the distance and tensionality effect sizes are small, and they are, they are comparable to, or in some cases, larger than those reported in some medical studies that are talked about as breakthroughs. So uh, ultimately with this type of research, I think we're gonna be hearing more about it. You know, I like to go into the woo-woo that actually our intentions of others affect them. And so again, it comes back to our vibe check is what are we bringing into the session? What are we bringing into the staff meeting and paying close attention to that? That's why we're always working on our biases and um, uh, wanting to make sure we're bringing our best self into each session. And then the stage of change, which if you haven't learned about, you will learn much more about. Uh, I do consider this a real breakthrough. Um, De Clemente and Prochaska's work with what are the stages we go through when we are undertaking really difficult changes in life. And from qualitative analysis, they define these six stages. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail with this because you're going to spend a lot more time with it. But what I do want you to think is always asking yourself, what stage am I in? What stage is my client in? And also, what stage are the medical providers I'm working with in? And so let's say I'm working with a provider who's not a champion of mental health care. I know from, so we would call that pre-contemplation. They're not thinking about change. They're not thinking about referring their clients to behavioral health. What I want to do if I'm working with this provider is to do my best to get to know that person. Okay? 
that's going to be the thing and let them know, Hey, I'm not asking you to refer. I just, I just kind of want to know more about you and whatever interactions you have so that we can stop to drop the defenses, make this more about a relationship, then trust can potentially be built so that they can be more open to the idea of behavioral health. So stage of change is not just for your client, it's for yourself, it's also for the providers. And I took this one from one of y'all's great videos because I had not heard it and I think it's wonderful. As a behavioral health clinician in integrated care, you are, the GATHER is the acronym. You're a generalist, so you can work with all different types of issues, whether it's anxiety or trauma or addiction. Uh, you're accessible. You're not just holed up in an office for 50-minute periods at a time. You're out and about. You're seen. Uh, it's team-based, so of course you're working with the providers and collaborating. It is high volume. A lot of times you've only got 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes max. There's a lot of similarity between working in integrated care and being a school counselor. Yes. The co-editor on the integrated care textbook that we wrote was a trained as a school counselor. And he said that was the best training ever to be an integrated care specialist because you have to work with administration, students, parents, and all other types of providers. Uh, you're an educator. You're providing information about uh, all types of things. And Kelly, uh, sorry, uh, Katie's talked about this as well. And, you know, in terms of how to deal with addiction and um, so forth. And then it's just routine. It's a part, you are a part of the provider. I do think the routine part is needed, but I also think they needed that to make it gather <laughs> as the acronym. But you're you're out and about. People know that, oh, we have behavioral health in this, and that's just a part of it. It's routine to have behavioral health in this particular clinic. All right, so thinking about you just have a few minutes with someone, and a provider might have just said, hey, Joy is going to meet with you. She's having trouble with sleep. She's got diabetes. She's going through a divorce. And she has this long history of depression. And sometimes that's what you get before you walk into a room with someone. Um, this is really a just way to think about after you've connected with them and learned what with them and there is this short session, you're focused on what they are. Maybe you've done some education. Now you've got a few minutes left. And before you check in on how it went between the two of you, how do I end this session, right? And so this is a brief action planning that's really made for integrated care. And it's this idea that it's very invitational. Is there anything you want to work on or your health in the next week or two? If they say no, you follow their lead. If they say yes, we're going to use more invitation and permission. So just a nice little chart to have nearby, especially for a practicum and internship. And I love the motivational interviewing at the end. So they're talking about something they're going to do. They've made a little bit of a commitment and we're asking like, how confident or sure do you feel about doing this? Because sometimes we make... I know I do make plans. And then I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a one. <laughs> Brief action planning. Just some examples that we wanted to give you some practical tools. If you see something you like, check it out further. But this is the, from the Kaiser Permanente group, but just know that integrated care doesn't have to be complicated. I know for those of you that might have felt like I felt where I'm like, I don't really know anything about medical issues. That is not what I went to school for, right? that it can be that we're learning just a little bit, but but clients are driving and we can learn together. And there are, I call these bubble charts. Um, they're really, I think called option tools, but there's one for every physical health issue and mental health issue you can think of, you can make your own, is the idea is I'm just coming alongside Russ. And I'm saying, we've talked a lot about different things today. You know, you said you wanted to make some changes. Do any of these work for you? And notice there's blank ones because he gets to write in one that that does or he might really cross one out, but this is about letting them lead, giving them menuing, lots of motivational interviewing, but it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, if you haven't seen this before, this is something that I've really um, found helpful and it's called the patient activation level. And it's really able to think about like, where is this person that I'm supporting as far as how engaged and activated they are? Are they just so overwhelmed? They can't even think about what to do next. Like everyone's just giving them all this stuff that's going on. Or are they actually closer to three or four where they're taking action? 
So it's about stage of change, but it's more about like their ability to really be part of their own care plan and make action in their own health. So you can get this online. And what we know is that the more activated someone is, uh, the more engaged they are in preventative behaviors, the more engaged they're going to be in healthy things that they're doing, and the more successful they are. And what we think about is self-management, like the things that I can do that really make me feel and control and empowered around my own health. It's also a nice way to talk to providers about somebody um, where their level of activation is and not that they don't care or they're resistant, right? But to really change the language to actually be more accurate and helpful. Um, if you haven't heard of shared decision-making, this can be a, a place to dive in. And really what this is, is this, this collaborative way of um, coming together with someone to make sure that they really are in charge of knowing what the decision is that is to be made around their health and having the options. Um, and this really came out of a, a large survey they did where they really looked at how involved did a client feel in making their own health decisions? And in this surveys, what they found is that clients were not well informed, that it was only half the time that anybody discussed pros or cons with them. And that often the people that were providing the care were working on a different goal than the client was, right? Like if we think about schizophrenia, that might be that the provider saying, oh, you don't want to hear voices. That's what I'm trying to treat, no voices. And maybe that person is actually saying, I just want to be able to play with my kids. And that is not the same goal if we work on. And that's the same thing for physical health. Someone might be treating um, diabetes and saying, I'm just looking at glucose levels when the person is actually saying, man, I wish I could still play the piano or I wish I could go walking with a friend. So really making sure that we are on the same page as the other person and, and, and making these decisions together. And how do we make these decisions together? There are things called decision aids. Um, this is one from the Mayo Clinic. I love this. This is about taking an antidepressant and it's really allowing the client to have some choice. And I will not ask anybody to raise their hands, but in a group this size, I bet there are many of us that have taken an antidepressant before. And we probably had wonderings about like, how is this gonna impact my weight or my sleep? What's it gonna cost me? What happens when I stop? Um, but likely we did not get to discuss this at detail or someone really walk us through that. And this is about being able to do that. This one you can do online. There's also paper charts where you really get to click on, you know what, I want to see if I take Lexapro, what's that going to be like for my sleep? Or, you know, what most important to me is my libido. What does that mean for each one of these? So it's really inviting the client into having much more information and voice. Um, that we know doesn't always have time to happen in a provider's office, but there's also these tools that we can help prep people for where they can really um, take some ownership about their care. And when we take ownership, right, we're more likely to follow through. We're more likely to speak up about how it's helping us and to engage in it. I'll just share briefly. We did a medication survey. This isn't formal. We literally just gave people a piece of paper where they could check out check off all the things that got in the way of them taking their medication. Prior to that, we would ask people, are you taking your medication? Anybody want to guess what people said? They were like, yes, the answer is yes. And then once we started doing this, we saw all kinds of things that were getting in the way of people taking medication. Like I don't want to, which is a very valid way of not wanting to take medication too. Like they couldn't pick it up. They forgot they were having trouble. They didn't like it, all those things. So sometimes we're just not allowing people and this intervention only took five seconds, right? It wasn't even on our time. They did it before. So just know sometimes there's lots of little ways to do things. And we always love to put some quotes that are inspiring on anything that we can when we give it to a client, because that also can be um, more information. And then this was just a, a way for Russ and I to name that uh, it's it can be uncomfortable being an in integrated care. And you all have talked about that a little bit, but I'll give that back to you, Russ. Yeah, well, again, we'll be brief here, but building the relationship, um, asking permission, if we can, um, can I share something that I've gleaned from the client, uh, give facts. So we want to give facts instead of like talking about the existentialness of this particular client. Physicians kind of like the facts and they like their algorithms. So we want to keep it right to the point. 
Uh, definitely documentation is important for this. Uh, talk about confidentiality and what can be shared because there's differences between the profession. Uh, Katie's got a good example of this. I don't know if she wants to share it now, but share client uh, progress, as we, which we've already mentioned. Um, oh, tell me, uh, Katie, you were sharing with me the soft front, hard back uh, piece of that. We share that with us. Yeah, yeah, that really helped me in my integrated experience, care experiences of thinking like I wanted to have this soft front, like kind and open and compassionate, but I also had to have a hard back, not be offended easily. I was telling Russ, when I was 23 in an integrated care, I remember the first time saying, hey, to a provider, hey, do you have a minute? And he said, no, and walked the <laughs> other way. That just hadn't happened to me yet, right? And I was like, oh, okay, well, I asked, right? So not, you know, people are busy and I'm not saying that we shouldn't all work on being kinder and more open and that there's not a cutoff problem happening where people are um, not being able to show up well themselves, but just keeping that in mind and that visual really helped me with that for sure. And we just wanted to name all of the areas that come up around ethics. And we know that this could be a you know two-day training here, but these things that might be a little bit different than our other settings. So things like um, confidentiality and informed consent. I remember the first time I was involved in school-based health, I know that all of the parents sign off at the very beginning of school when they sign everything else. Now that covers HIPAA, that's medically like that's consent. But it also, as a counselor, I'm like, oh, that feels funny. Like, did they know they signed off on fine. counseling? Yes. Um, and so just knowing that and and then going, okay, what's in my sphere to, to you know, is it that I'm going to make sure I'm going to call a parent every time and make sure they truly know consent? Um, dual relationships, you know, primary care providers, they're very different about confidentiality and who they see and can they see somebody they know or they play golf with or they have lunch with. Um, so some of these things are just very different. And it's something that you just learn along the way. Um, and also like when it happens, like how do I notice it and get support and know how to address it, but definitely use the people in your, your crew and the system inequities, right? What do I notice and I need to give voice to um, and really paying attention to that is happening. It is a system and how do I get support and also um, stay in my zone, as I say, to, to address some of these things. And then Russ, do you want to move past this for today? Or do you want me to share about that briefly? Maybe briefly. I know we've got about five minutes left and um, yeah. clearly want me to get to everything. But yeah, I think this is important for, yeah. Yeah. So this is just, um, this is one model of a um, trauma and resiliency informed model. This is called Reconnect for Resilience. But I just wanted to share it. It's something we train all of our folks that are in primary care and then offer it to everyone in the settings as well. And many have taken us up on it. But it's really this understanding that we're all impacted by stress and trauma. And you see this light green is like, how do I know when I'm in my zone, right? Whether that's checking my vibe box, where am I at? Or using the stop and being present. That we know this isn't going to be stress-free to be in this field. But what are the things that I do to stay in my zone? And that when I'm in my zone, that's really the only way I can connect and be understanding and support other people. And in this model, it's all about recognizing that fight and flight that Russ mentioned earlier, um, that there are things that amp us up. And you see that on that orange, right? Where we anxious, we can't calm down. And there are those things on that bottom green that really make us feel shut down. Um, sometimes we feel both. It's like the gas pedal and the brake pedal all at the same time are going through the nervous system. Um, that can be a great description of trauma, but it's also around stress. When I see this model, I think about the doctor that Audrey was sharing about, right? That is got all of this amped up energy, but is also really disconnected from people. Like that's a lot of stress and I'm just gonna put my head down and stay in my chart because I don't know how to manage. So this is just one way to think about when stress is unhealthy. We also know like that's why life is not a stress-free zone. You see these charges and releases and we just wanna encourage all of you to think about what are the things that you do moment by moment to take care of yourself. It can't always be after work on the weekends or in the summer when you take a week off. We've got to find a way to take care of ourselves, walking from one exam room to the other. And maybe that's taking a breath or maybe it's looking at the picture of our dog on our phone, but just thinking about these in the moment, self-care is moment by moment um, so that we can continue to do this hard work.
Maybe can we probably skip the next two slides? Yeah. Let's see. Absolutely. Yeah, let's let's stay here. This might be the last. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Um, I appreciate the in the moment self care. That's one thing we talk a lot about in our program. A sample brief session could look like this: is that you're talking with the client um, after kind of gaining some information about what they're experiencing. Maybe ask them to rate it on a scale of one to ten. One less problematic, ten very. Discuss if there's any exceptions to that issue. Like, when is this issue less problematic? When are you less anxious, if at all? Um, discuss past situations. So we're, we're very much of a solution-focused standpoint. Is, okay, have you had times when you've experienced issues like this, whether it's anxiety or depression, in the past? And if so, what's helped? Even if just 10%, what's helped? And then asking about what small step they could take. Okay, so I'm gathered some information. I'm wanting to get to know this person better. I realize this is a brief session. Uh, between now and when I talk with you next, it may be a virtual meeting. What's a small step that may make things a little bit better? We're going to make sure you get seen by the physician, or maybe you already have. Maybe they're going to be starting the medication. We can kind of check in with how that's doing. Is this increased symptoms or side effects of medication? So as Behavioral health professionals, the more you learn about the medications, uh, the more helpful you're going to be. So you can kind of judge that. And I often would have a psychiatrist come in and say, hey, I've increased medications. Can you see if this is side effect or more symptoms? Um, and then possibly, and this, this depends on the situation and client, is, all right, I know you're experiencing a lot now. When we have time, I'd love to talk to you more about what chapter two, what, what, what is this going to be like for you when things are a little bit better? Could we start working on or talking about the beginning stages of chapter two for you? So just as kind of a sample brief therapy session that can be used in integrated care settings and beyond, uh, this is a, a little general framework that can be helpful. Uh, maybe we go through the PHQ-9 just real quickly. We've got one minute, I think, Katie. I think I, if you're not familiar with this, know that uh, this can have some utility in many different ways. First of all, it was created by Pfizer. Um, and so uh, because of the medical, that may give us a little credence with the medical community is that, wow, we're actually using um, a standardized assessment I would need to get back into the norm groups on this. I, I suspect we need more diversity on norming. But with the sample patient health questionnaire nine, as I told you, this is what my physician uses with me on the annual visits, is with good assessments, if, I'm, if I have the time with a client, yes, they can fill out all of these and we can get a number. But also, I would like to talk about each one. Um, I'm always interested in how people interpret the questions, if anything said here is discriminating or confusing. No. But just, just know that these are in the public domain. Did I talk over somebody? Where are we? Just know that the PHQ-9 is in the public domain. Um, there's all kind of online versions you can use. And this is measuring a brief uh, measure of depression. And on the next slide, Again, to kind of give credence when working within medical profession, the medical profession loves their algorithms. So when they're sitting there with their laptop, they're oftentimes looking at the algorithm. All right, we've given this person this for cholesterol. What does this mean in terms of other meds or so forth? Is to be able to share that, oh yeah, I, actually I know the score and I can compare that to an algorithm. So if this person scored moderately 10 to 14, we want to make sure that they we maybe screen for suicidal ideation. Also make sure that we are referring or I'm checking in with them weekly for perhaps uh, counseling sessions to provide education and support. So again, uh, it, it's helpful for the behavioral health professionals to have these uh, public domain kind of instruments. And I noticed that we're one minute over. We certainly do have other stuff but I don't want to infringe on your time. I know you've got other training. So how about we stop here? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yeah.
I, I am hoping as we finish up here that you will look at your list of mindset and clinical skills. Uh, hopefully we can get you uh, a copy of the PowerPoint or at least in a PDF version. And I'm very grateful for your engagement uh, and, and taking time to learn about this. Thank you for being here.